uh, dating shows that this wetland carbon 14 uh, dating shows that this wetland to be over 10,000 years old. Let's see. This wetland that you're looking at was dug by hand over 2,000 years ago. It supports a diversity of salamanders, frogs, and toads. The soil from digging the wetland was piled along the edges, and you can see the high berms along the edge of this wetland. Pretty remarkable that a hand-dug wetland would last for 2,000 years. This beautiful wetland was dug in the state of South Carolina in the U.S., and it was dug over 300 years ago. The wetland basin is in compacted clay layers, and the clay was removed originally to build um, bricks for homes. The wetland you're looking at here was constructed by hand using livestock to move the soil, and it's near the community of Big Ditch in the state of West Virginia. And it was built in the 1800s to provide water for livestock. And the examples I've shown you uh, show that it is possible to build a wetland that will last for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, without maintenance. Now we're going to figure out how this can be done. I suggest beginning your wetland restoration project by setting clear objectives. Write down a few objectives for what type of wetland you would like to build and how you want to build it. There are many different types of wetlands uh, that may be restored. This wetland that you're looking at is a shallow marsh, or we call it an emergent wetland. The plants emerge out of the water. And uh, this wetland was restored five years ago. Here's a wetland that is called a shrub scrub wetland, and it's growing all these shrubs. Uh, this wetland is very important to moose for food. Ephemeral wetlands are wetlands that dry uh, during the dry season, and they fill during the raining season. And we are restoring this type of wetland to provide breeding habitat for salamanders and other amphibians. Ephemeral wetlands may also be built so that their water levels will fluctuate. When attempting to provide habitat for shorebirds, we want the water levels to fluctuate, and that way plants will not dominate the basin. And the mud will be available, and this mud provides important habitat to invertebrates, and that's what the shorebirds are feeding on. It is now possible to restore wet meadow wetlands that provide an important diversity of flowering plants. And these flowering plants are used by pollinators, the bees, and the butterflies. Your objectives may include uh, uh, restoring a diversity of wetlands in one place. Here we see wet meadow wetland, and within the wet meadow wetland is an ephemeral wetland that dries seasonally. One should determine in advance how large of a wetland you would like to restore on a site. Small wetlands can be really important to animals. Uh, this small wetland that you're looking at here uh, provides habitat uh, to clam shrimp and it provides habitat to the marbled salamander. And the wetland is no larger than the desk in front of you. Some landowners are very interested in restoring wetlands to provide habitat for ducks. You're looking at the wood duck here, one of the most beautiful wood duck species of ducks, and um, we can build wetlands to provide habitat for waterfowl. You may also build wetlands to provide habitat for the sandhill crane and other crane species. We're building more and more wetlands that provide habitat for shorebirds, like this avocet. There are a number of rare bat species in the United States and in Canada, and there is great interest in building wetlands to provide habitat for these rare species of bats. There are many deer hunters in the United States and Canada, 
And oftentimes I am asked to restore a wetland area to provide habitat for deer or for elk or for moose. Aquatic plant Are you able to hear me okay? Okay, this wetland here, is the aquatic plants in this wetland, uh, they are very high in sodium. They concentrate sodium. And this is really important for ungulates like the deer for their sodium budget. I am currently working on a major project in British Columbia, Canada, where we are building wetlands to provide habitat for the northern leopard frog, a species at risk. And we are building an average of one wetland per day using five pieces of heavy equipment. Wetland plants such as the button bush are very important for uh, invertebrates like the monarch butterfly. And we are building many wetlands with flowering plants to provide habitat for the monarch. All right, historical aerial photographs uh, can show you where wetlands once occurred on the landscape. You're looking at a composite of aerial photographs that were taken in the year 1929. And this photograph shows the wetlands, which are very dark in color, almost black and gray in color. And this is before they were drained. Now, all the wetlands you're looking at here that are dark gray or black have been drained from 1929 to the 1980s. We geo-referenced this aerial photograph and I use it while I'm outdoors. Uh, I use the Avenza app, uh, the Avenza app on my cell phone, and it will show me exactly where the water was in the wetlands prior to drainage. And this is a great tool uh, to use in restoring wetland areas. This aerial photograph was taken many years ago and it shows where wetlands have been drained and filled. The photograph was taken in the 1960s and it shows many, many parallel lines. Those parallel lines, that's a pattern of farming we call lands, L-A-N-D-S. And the lands pattern was used to farm wetland areas. This is a LIDAR image. LIDAR image is of critical importance in identifying places to restore wetlands. This LIDAR image clearly shows where wetlands have been drained. You can see the basins that were once wetland area and the straight lines, which are the ditches and the moved streams. And this shows a landscape that has been heavily modified. It is completely forested. There are dense trees, but the LIDAR image is so good in helping us find where the wetlands once occurred. Okay, the majority of wetlands that we find on the landscape are in shallow basins and they have a rim or now they have a uh, dam, a natural dam around the lower edge. And this natural rim is generally wider than 20 meters and it will have a gradual slope less than 5%. And this natural rim acts like a natural dam, but it does not look like a dam. And this is what uh, holds the water in the wetland area. Now wetlands are drained by digging a ditch through that natural rim of the natural wetland. And this ditch will remove water from the wetland, groundwater as well as surface water. The number one clue to finding a drained wetland is to look for a ditch. And the dashed red line shows a ditch that was dug to drain a natural wetland. Now ditches are dug to drain wetlands and again, the dashed red line shows the center of a ditch that was dug to drain the wetland area. And people have been digging ditches to drain wetlands for thousands of years. Ditches may be wide or ditches may be narrow. And this photo, the dashed red line, shows the center of a wide ditch. Now, many people would consider this to be a natural wetland. It is not. This is actually a ditch that has cattails, which are wetland plants in it. You're looking at a drained wetland, and I know it's a drained wetland because it is a shallow basin with a ditch, and it's dominated by reed canary grass. Reed canary grass is a non-native invasive species, and it grows very tall in the basins of drained wetlands. 
Another sign of a drained wetland is the presence of water standing in road ruts. Oftentimes when I'm in the woods looking for drained wetlands, I can see these road ruts containing water. They show me where a wetland has been drained and filled. Take your time examining areas on the ground when you're designing a wetland project. The small hole that you see in the center of this photograph, it shows that drainage structures have been buried underground to remove water from a natural wetland. And these drainage structures are failing, so soil from the surface is being uh, brought into the ground, and this is creating a vertical hole. And this shows us where we may restore a wetland area. In using a wetland, in, in finding a place to build a wetland or to restore a wetland, I recommend using the Clinometer app on your smartphone, or you can use a clinometer, which this person is holding, to measure slope. And the wetland you build, it should be built on a slope of less than 6%, which is fairly level ground. I recommend using a laser. This is called a laser level. And you should measure the elevation change from the upper to lower edge of your work area. And the change in elevation in your work area should be one meter or less. Ideally, it would be only 30 centimeters. And in this photo, you can see the ditch that was dug to drain the wetland area. I recommend using a key that I've developed to choose the best technique for building a wetland on your site. And I will share this uh, key with the participants. One of the first steps that I use in uh, designing a wetland project is to dig a hole in the center of the area where we like to build a wetland. And the hole should be dug at least 1.3 meters deep. And it's best to dig a number of these holes if your area is fairly large. And this will give you a good idea if there is groundwater in, on the area, if the water table is high, and what the texture of soil is. So in digging this test hole in the center of your planned wetland area, examine the hole to see if water is entering the hole from the sides of the hole you dug. And if it's pouring in from the surface, that's not a good indication of groundwater, but if it's seeping in from the sides, that shows you that groundwater is present. I use a tool called a tile probe. Uh, this one is 1.3 meters long, and it's quite small in diameter, only 3 eighths of an inch. And you can push this into the ground, and this will tell you whether or not there's water in the ground. If you can push it in with one hand, there's groundwater. Uh, if it takes a lot of force to push it in, there may be rock or there, you know, there may be clay present. I highly recommend digging deep test holes in large planned wetland areas. Here we're using what's called a backhoe to dig a deep test hole on a site, and this will help us to identify if groundwater is present or clay is present. Here's a deep test hole dug using a backhoe, and if you look in the bottom of the hole, you can see that groundwater is rising near the surface, and there are layers of clay textured soil, and there are layers of gravel. Here we have dug a deep test hole using a backhoe, and we are examining the layers of soil and identifying their soil texture. And this test hole uncovered that we had 45 centimeters of silt loam, over 110 centimeters of clay, but beneath the clay was 60 centimeters of clay loam, and this was over gravel. So this was a very difficult wetland to restore. I recommend using colored plastic ribbons to mark the perimeter of the wetland that you want to build. And here we are in a forested area and we're using these colored plastic ribbons to mark where we want to build the wetland. Purchase high quality plastic ribbons or flagging to mark the perimeter of the wetland you want to build. This ribbon that you see in this photograph, I tied it six years ago to mark the perimeter of a wetland project that we are building this summer in the state of California. I also recommend using a wire flag to mark the center of the wetland that you wanna build. 
and then using a GPS to record this location. Here we have used a wood stake to mark the center of a wetland we want to build. And we have also used a GPS to record this location. Now, here's a wetland that we want to restore. It was partially drained with the ditch. So what we, we did is we marked the perimeter of it with colored plastic flagging. And now we're using our cell phone, the Avenza app, or an app called Fields Area Measure. And this will record the perimeter of the wetland we want to build. And then if someone removes the ribbons, we still know where the wetland is we want to build. I recommend completing a design form for each wetland uh, that you want to build. And I will share this uh, design form with participants. I complete one of these for each wetland site I visit and design. If you want to build a wetland that will last forever, do not build a dam. Uh, here, someone has built a dam. And why are we concerned about building a dam for a wetland area? If you build a dam, you have to maintain the dam by mowing. You don't want trees to grow on it. If you build a dam, animals can burrow into the dam and cause failure of the wetland. If you build a dam, you have to also maintain a spillway that carries water around the dam. Otherwise, the dam will wash out. Dams are artificial looking and also dams block fish passage, aquatic organism passage and drainages. And in many localities, it re you're required to get permits to build a dam. So many, many engineers build dams in restoring wetlands. Uh, I used to build dams. I built over 1,400 dams. I no longer build dams because when you build a dam, there's a risk of failure. The wetland you build may fill with soil because you dug the hole to build the dam. And you have to build a spillway. You must inspect the dam on a regular basis. You may need permits to build the dam. And if you're blocking aquatic organism passage, mitigation may be quite required. So I recommend you don't build dams. Here's a dam that was built a number of years ago. An animal called a muskrat has burrowed into it and caused the dam to fail. Uh, here's a dam that I built a number of years ago. Beaver moved in, dug a channel through the dam and are causing the wetland to fail. You're looking at a high dam that was built by another individual to build a wetland. The dam has washed out. The spillway has head cut. A head cut is like a waterfall and it causes great erosion in the drainage. It will destroy the wetland and the dam. I do not recommend installing pipes in any wetland that you build. All pipes must someday be replaced and they add a point of weakness to your wetland area that could cause failure of the wetland. I don't recommend installing valves in your wetland areas. This valve is leaking and is causing failure of the wetland that was built 40 years before. This is a water control structure that has failed in a wetland area. The builders built a dam and installed a water control structure. Ice has destroyed the water control structure and the wetland is now failing and the dam has washed out in places. Here is a walkway that was built to access a water control structure in a constructed wetland. The walkway has rotted. It is not safe to walk on anymore. The valve can no longer be opened or closed because it is rusted. So this wetland is being damaged and destroyed because of a faulty water control structure. Now, many people think you can use water control structures that are made out of plastic or fiberglass. I've installed over 1,000 of these and they have all failed. They leak and they are damaged by tractors and heavy equipment. If you remove the plates inside of a water control structure, you'll notice that there is a gasket. These gaskets will deteriorate over the years, causing your wetland to leak and no longer hold water. This is a water control structure called a flashboard riser. This was very popular in the United States 30 to 40 years ago. We no longer use them because they leak. 
and it's impossible to make them so they do not leak. And this water control structure is also very dangerous. If beaver are to block this, if they were to block this, and you were to try to free it of debris, the rush of water would force you to go into the structure and you could drown as a result. The red arrow points to a water control structure, a flashboard riser that was installed 30 years ago, and it has been completely covered by beaver and is no longer functioning, but yet it is still leaking under the water. An outdated way of building wetlands was to build a dam around an area and then to install a pump and the pump fills the wetland with water. Well, wetland managers have found that the cost of operating and maintaining these pumps is very high. So one should not use a pump to fill your wetland if at all possible. Wetland managers will tell you about the serious problems and expensive problems in using pumps to fill their wetland areas. When working with engineers to build wetland areas, I recommend that you do not build dams and you do not use water control structures. If you use a dam and a water control structure, you are building a wetland that will fail in maybe 20 to 30 years. To build larger wetlands, it's important to use heavy equipment. Uh, this machine is called an excavator, and it is used to efficiently move a large quantity of soil needed to build a wetland area. Here we're looking at a machine called a dozer. The dozers are very good for pushing the soil needed to restore wetlands. This dozer has very wide tracks, so it will not sink in the saturated soil of the wetland we're building. I recommend using a service contract to build wetland areas. Under a service contract, you are paying the operator by the hour to build the wetland, not by the job. When building a wetland, there are many unknowns that are buried in the ground. And if you are paying the heavy equipment operator by the hour, uh, you're going to get quite a bit lower cost for building the wetland. When I build wetlands, I use a service contract where we pay contractors by the hour and we are able to build wetlands for less than 10% of the cost that an engineering company would charge to build a wetland area. When building a wetland, I recommend that you are on the project site 100% of the time to supervise the heavy equipment operators in building the wetland. It's very important that you are on the ground during construction to monitor soil texture, to monitor groundwater elevations, and to record elevations using a laser. The first technique we're gonna go over to build a wetland area is called the surface water technique with a groundwater dam. The surface water technique with a groundwater dam is the most efficient and lowest cost way to build a large natural wetland. When using a surface water technique with a groundwater dam, it is important to find soil that is high in clay. Uh, you must be able to form a long and a thin ribbon that is at least five centimeters long before it breaks. This shows you that the soil texture is high in clay. When building a wetland using the surface water technique, I recommend taking action to disable and fill ditches. The ditches should be blocked both above ground and below ground. This drawing shows a profile view of a wetland that we are building using the surface water technique. The wetland is built deepest in the center. We use rock to prevent head cuts from forming at the outlet or spillway and we use rock to prevent head cuts from forming at the inlet. And we compact clay in the ground around the lower perimeter, and this is called a groundwater dam, and it reduces this water out of the wetland. Here's a plan view that shows the location of a groundwater dam that we use to build a wetland using the surface water technique.
A dozer is used to remove topsoil from the planned wetland area. And the dozer will pile this soil near the edge of the wetland for later spreading in the completed wetland. The excavator will dig a trench along the lower two thirds perimeter of the wetland you want to build. So here the excavator is digging this trench and soil that's high in sand and gravel is placed on the back side of the wetland we're building. Soil that is high in clay is placed inside of the wetland we're building that will later be placed into the trench and compacted to form a groundwater dam. And here we see the dozer that is pushing soil high in clay in the trench. The bottom of the trench is based on an impermeable layer of bedrock or an impermeable layer of clay that is quite thick. The dozer places the soil into the depression, into the core trench, in layers no thicker than 15 centimeters and compacts each layer. So here we see that the trench has been dug and partially filled with clay that's compacted. The dozer is now pushing clay into the trench and compacting it in layers. You can see the gravel that is piled outside of the wetland area that will not be placed in the trench because it is permeable and will cause the wetland to leak water. In digging this trench to build a groundwater dam around the lower two thirds perimeter of the wetland you're building, you may find where clay tiles have been buried to drain the wetland many years ago. You may also find where logs or sticks have been buried in the ground and covered with soil to drain the wetland many years ago. Here we uncovered a buried drainage structure that was made using concrete pipes. We are digging the trench for groundwater dam and we found that this clay tile structure was surrounded with gravel and was used to drain the wetland area. Here we had restored a stream across this farm field. The stream was sucked underground. We started digging in the area. We found where clay tiles had been buried. We removed the clay tiles. We compacted soil that's high in clay in the trench. And then the stream was able to flow on the surface. So digging the trench for the groundwater dam will allow you to find buried drainage structures. This is a buried drainage structure made out of plastic that was used to drain the wetland area. We're able to cut out sections of this and compact it with clay to restore the wetland. Uh, in building a groundwater dam, this will prevent animals like the crayfish that burrow into the ground from draining your wetland area. So what's a wetland look like building using the surface water technique with a groundwater dam? Well, here's one wetland that we built using this technique. Here's another large wetland we built using the surface water technique. And this is on a 100 year floodplain. And here's a wetland that we built using the surface water technique. And this wetland was built on a site that was mined. Wetlands of any size may be built using the surface water technique with a groundwater dam. Here's a wet meadow that we built using the technique. Here's a forested wetland that we built using the technique. And here's another forested wetland we built using the surface water technique with a groundwater dam. Now we're gonna look at another technique that I've developed. It is called the groundwater technique for building wetland areas. And um, the groundwater technique is used on sites where the water table is close to the surface. Here is a groundwater supplied wetland that we built at the Southwestern Research Station in Arizona. And this is an arid region in the desert. And we built this on a site that was supplied with water from a spring. Here's a wetland we built using the groundwater technique on a site that was dominated from cattails. The open water will provide habitat for waterfowl. How do you know groundwater is near the surface? You may see it standing in the depression left when a large tree falls over. This shows us that groundwater is near the surface. I recommend digging a hole. 
If you dig a small diameter hole and water enters your test hole, then you know that you have groundwater near the surface and the groundwater technique may be used to build your wetland. When building a wetland on a site using groundwater, it's often the soils are saturated and heavy equipment can become stuck. So when building on these sites, it's important to use low ground pressure heavy equipment. And you can see here where we took a dozer that was low ground pressure and we were able to go across the saturated soils and not get stuck. Here an excavator is building a wetland using the groundwater technique on a site that has saturated soils. This is an old field that's dominated by reed canary grass and it also has a lot of cattails. So here what we're doing is that we're digging into the groundwater and oftentimes it's best to do this during the dry time of year so you don't have so much water to contend with. Some of the sites that we build in the winter, we have to use logs to keep the excavator from sinking. And the excavator places the logs in front of the machine, crawls up in the logs, and the logs keep the excavator from sinking in the mud. And here you see an excavator that's uh, placing the logs and is able to stay afloat without getting stuck while it builds the wetland area. Uh, this is Ted Crane, a heavy equipment operator. Oh, he is really good at building wetlands. And he places these logs in front of the machine and he builds some of the best looking wetlands I've seen. Uh, here is Ted building a wetland area. Notice the pink flags that mark the perimeter of the wetland we're building. The dozer is used to push soil away from the excavator. It's important that the dozer does not try to dig. If the dozer tries to dig, it will break through the vegetation layer and get stuck. So we use the excavators for digging and the dozer for pushing the soil. And here you see a dozer with two excavators working together to build a wetland using the groundwater technique. Each excavator is perched on logs. The small excavator is digging the wetland and depositing the soil near the large excavator. The large excavator is moving the soil closer to the dozer. The dozer then spreads the soil on higher ground. Here the dozer is pushing the soil away from the excavator. It is not digging. The dozer would become stuck if it tried to dig and push at the same time. Here's a portion of the wetland that was dug the day before. You can see that the depressions are filling with groundwater. Here the dozer is shaping the soil that is removed and the soil was allowed to freeze overnight so it would be possible to shape it and not get stuck in the mud. Now in building a wetland using the groundwater technique, if you build a one hectare size wetland, you will need one hectare of land to spread the soil. It's like taking a pie out of a pie tin. You need an equal area of land for spreading the soil that's removed. Here you see that we're spreading, we're placing and planting clumps of native vegetation, sedges and rushes in the wetland that we're building using the groundwater technique. We also place many logs in the wetland area to provide habitat for a diversity of wildlife species. And here we're placing a snag, a vertical piece of wood. This will provide a perch for birds in the wetland we're building. It is often necessary to build a groundwater dam when building a wetland using the groundwater technique. What we're doing here is we're building a groundwater dam across a ditch that was used to drain the wetland area. And the base of the groundwater dam is on clay. Um, the groundwater dam is at least two to three meters wide, and we place soil that's high in clay in this trench, and we compact it. So the trench for the groundwater dam extends down to a thick layer of clay, and the trench will span the entire width of the ditch, and it actually spans the 100-year floodplain of the ditch. Here we are building a wetland using the groundwater technique and we are building this groundwater dam around the lower two thirds perimeter of the wetland we're building. Uh, this groundwater dam is based on a thick layer of clay and while we are building it, we are intercept intercepted 
many, many buried drainage structures made out of plastic. Uh, this area was a golf course and we're restoring wetlands on it. And when working on old golf courses, uh, they are full of buried drainage structures. Here we were building a groundwater dam and you can see the pipes that we unearthed in digging the trench. So when we build a wetland, we generally make them deepest in the center and we like gradual slopes and we like pits and mounds. And we like to place trees and shrubs in them. So when they fill for a broad habitat for many of the animals using the wetland. Here's a groundwater supplied wetland. It is filling as we are building it. Most groundwater wetlands fill within a couple of days of construction. It takes time to spread the soil that is removed from building a wetland using a groundwater technique. When spreading the soil within and around a wetland area, I do not recommend compacting the soil. What you're looking at here is soil that has been compacted using a dozer. And this is a standard technique used for construction. I don't recommend using this technique because plants are slow to grow on, on compacted soil and it is, the site is more likely to wash and erode if it is compacted. This is what happens when you spread grass seed on compacted soil. You are lucky if the seed comes up in the cleats of the dozer tracks. And when there is a rain, this site is likely to erode. So what do we do that's different? We loosen all compacted soils within and surrounding the wetland we are restoring. And we call this technique the rough and loosen technique. When you build a wetland area, you end up compacting a lot of soil around the wetland. It is important to take the excavator and the excavator bucket and to loosen the soil to a depth of one meter or more. So then it will absorb water and not wash. Here's an example. Notice the compacted soils in the center. This is where we're building a trail. Notice the soils on either edge of the compacted soils. These were loosened using the rough and loosen technique. We often mix woody debris in, branches and logs when we're loosening compacted soils. Plants are more likely to germinate and grow and the water will soak into the ground instead of running off and causing erosion. I'd like to introduce you to a heavy equipment operator, Grant Midtall. We built this wetland today using the groundwater technique in the province of British Columbia, Canada. And we're building the wetland to provide habitat for the northern leopard frog and the western painted turtle. And notice how rough the bottom of the wetland is. Uh, we have many pits and mounds. Also notice that we have replanted clumps of sedges that were present prior to construction. Look at the diversity of aquatic plants in this restored wetland. The high diversity of plants is a result of building a shallow basin where we loosened soils using the rough and loosen technique. This wetland is less than two years old and it's supporting sandhill cranes, frogs, toads, salamanders, and a great diversity of plants. We now establish wet metal wetlands from the soil that we remove from building wetlands of other types. If we shape the soil that is removed in a shallow basin, and if we loosen it, then we can expect sedges and rushes to grow, developing additional wet metal habitat. Here's an area where we spread soil in building in the emergent wetland, we spread the soil and we made a wet metal wetland that is being used by the uh, young frogs and toads. Here's a stream the day we restored it, and we restored this using the groundwater technique with a groundwater dam. Here is a river that we restored last year in Canada using the groundwater technique with a groundwater dam. Now, when you build a wetland using the groundwater technique, it looks like a mess. There's soil all over the place. It looks like a bomb went off. So here we are spreading the soil. You can see that the water is filling this new wetland. 
Well, this is the day we built the wetlands. It looks pretty bad. Let's go back and look at it a year later. Looks pretty good now, doesn't it? Look at how quickly the aquatic plants come in. Groundwater uh, wetlands support a diversity of aquatic plants and they are colonized by aquatic plants quickly after construction. Uh, here's a groundwater technique. We use this to build a wetland in British Columbia for the northern leopard frog. And here it is six months after construction. Isn't that a beautiful wetland? We restored it. This area was drained to make a farm field. We restored this in British Columbia for the northern leopard frog. And here it is one year after construction. You're looking at a stream that we restored in Kentucky. And we restored this using groundwater dams and using the groundwater technique. Oh, by the way, this is only two years old. Here's a wetland that we restored on a golf course using the groundwater technique on Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, that was dominated by reed canary grass. Now it has diversity of sedges. Here's a wetland that was also restored from a golf course. It was dominated by reed canary grass. Now it supports a diversity of sedges, again, using the groundwater technique. So how do you ensure that non-native plants will not take over your restored wetlands? I recommend making the topography in the basin quite varied. Make many pits and mounds and you'll get a diversity of native aquatic plants. And in building the wetland, make many mounds like this and they'll support many plants just like a planter in front of a house. Uh, here's a wetland that we built using the groundwater technique one day after construction. We often build in the winter because the frozen soils will keep the heavy equipment from sinking. Here's a wetland we built using the groundwater technique and we did use explosives to build this wetland. This wetland was built 20 years ago. Okay, we're gonna go over another technique for building wetlands. This is the compacted clay liner technique. And our example is from the state of New Mexico, an arid region where there is no groundwater, no groundwater is present at all. We don't wanna use pumps, we don't wanna build a dam. So we're gonna use a compacted clay liner technique because our test hole showed that there were permeable soils below the surface. So here's the site we're looking at, it's called Blue Lake. It doesn't look like a lake. It occurs at high elevation and it's in a basin that does not have a stream entering it. Ponderosa pines surround it. It's largely a dry meadow and it has not held water for many, many years. So many, many years ago, somebody dug a ranch pond in the center of Blue Lake. And a Blue Lake used to hold close to two meters of water. Now it doesn't hold water at all. Well, the Forest Service was concerned about the pond that was dug by the rancher. So in 1994, they tried to seal it with bentonite. Bentonite is similar to clay. They put a thin layer of it in. They spent close to $30,000. It did not seal it. Bentonite is not effective for sealing permeable soils. I have never had success using bentonite. They built a fence around Blue Lake thinking the cows that were herding it, but that didn't make any difference. They asked me to come in and look at Blue Lake. So we dug test holes and uh, we determined uh, there was about four inches of topsoil on the surface. There was a little over a meter of clay beneath and we were using a soil auger. I was not happy with the results of a test hole. I liked the clay that we found near the surface but what we decided to do is to bring in a backhoe and to dig a deeper hole. So here we're digging a deeper hole using a backhoe in the center of Blue Lake. And digging this deep hole, we found that there was clay overlying sand. So here we went into the middle of these deeply constructed ranch ponds in the middle of Blue Lake. We dug a deep test hole with a backhoe and we found that the clay was over sand. So what was happening is the water was entering the deep ponds that were constructed many years ago, and it was flowing into the ground through the sand layers. 
So we came up with the prescription of using the compacted clay liner technique. We would reshape the deep constructed ponds within Blue Lake and place a thick layer of clay that's compacted 70 centimeters thick in the basin to prevent the ponds from leaking. So here's our prescription right here. We wanted the wetland to be perched on a thick layer of clay. And that clay layer better be 70 centimeters thick or more, and it better be compacted or it won't work. So here's what the project looks like. Uh, we took the deep constructed ponds, combined them into an emergent wetland, and then we planned smaller ephemeral wetlands within the basin that was Blue Lake. So a dozer was used to remove the topsoil from the site and we saved the topsoil. And the, the clay was quite compacted, so we had to use the rippers on the dozer to, so we could loosen the clay to remove it. And here the dozer is removing the clay in thick layers and piling it for later use. And if you look closely, you can see the orange colored sand. That means we've gone deep enough. The clay was very dry, so we had to bring out pumper trucks and we had to wet the clay and mix it so it had suitable moisture content for compaction. This is a demanding process. You have to continually test soil moisture to make sure there's enough moisture for compaction and not too much moisture or you're not able to compact the clay. So we used many, many truckloads of water to moisten the soil that's high in clay that we piled. And here we are spreading a layer of the clay in the basin, 15 centimeters thick. We're using a backhoe here to compact that clay. The backhoe is used because it has rubber tires and it has great ground pressure. We put the clay in 15 centimeter thick layers. And then what we do is we compact it using the backhoe. Notice the bucket of the backhoe is full of soil. That's for added weight. So we have more compaction. This takes time to compact soils. It takes a long time to build a wetland using a compacted clay liner. And it's expensive because it involves a lot of compaction and a lot of heavy equipment time. You have to monitor the clay thickness using a laser. You have to make sure it's at least 70 centimeters thick or your wetland will not hold water. And here we are putting it layer after layer, building it up and giving it a natural shape. And again, we're testing the thickness of the clay using a laser. When we're all done compacting soil in the basin, we spread soil, topsoil, over the surface of the compacted clay, and we keep the topsoil loose. We do not compact the topsoil. Here we are placing topsoil in the basin that has compacted clay. And this is what happened when the monsoon came. It filled with water, and it held water. And here's what the smaller ephemeral wetlands look like that also were built using the compacted clay liner technique. And what was exciting is that the last time the wetland held water was 50 years ago. We saved the topsoil, we spread it in the bottom, and we have crustaceans that hatched from the cysts, the tadpole shrimp and the fairy shrimp. They had laid dormant in the dry soils of the drained wetland for close to 50 years. We have built many wetlands using the compacted clay liner technique. Here's a wetland that we built in the state of Illinois. It's being used by over a thousand sandhill cranes. Here's another wetland that we built using the compacted clay liner technique. And here's one that we built in Arizona using the compacted clay liner technique. And here's one that we use in New York, built in New York. Now you use the compacted clay liner technique when there is no impermeable substrate within reach. So you'll have a layer of clay overlaying gravel or sand, then you may want to use the compacted clay liner technique. And here's another wetland used, built using the compacted clay liner technique. You can see they look quite natural and are occupied by quite a few wildlife species. And here's another one that we built at a convent in Melbourne, Kentucky. Here's one that we built at a school. Okay, our last technique we're going over is the synthetic liner technique. Now we use this technique where we have no clay. There's no clay present. There's no groundwater present. 
We can't use the surface water technique with a groundwater dam. We can't use the groundwater technique. We can't use the compacted clay liner technique, but we still want a wetland. We can use the synthetic liner. Here's a site where we're going to build a wetland using the synthetic liner technique. Uh, this is a log landing on a timber sale area. This is where they stack the logs up and it's filled with a mixture of rock and wood that cannot be made to hold water. Here's a profile view of using a synthetic liner. What we're doing here is that we are protecting the liner on both sides with a thick layer of geotextile. We are anchoring the top edge of the liner with spikes that are 12 inches long, and we're covering the liner with at least six inches of soil. An excavator is used to clear vegetation from the site. We dig a deep hole in the center of the wetland we're building. The elevation in the bottom of the hole is equal to the final depth of the plant wetland plus the thickness of soil that we will place over the liner and layers of geotextile. We use a stake made out of rebar. We drive that into the bottom of the hole, the center bottom of the hole. The stake marks the center of the bottom of the wetland and the bottom of the stake is the elevation plus the thickness of soil we're gonna cover the liner with. And then we attach a tape measure to this piece of rebar. So here you see the rebar in the bottom of the hole. You can see that the hole is sloped up to the surface. Now the excavator is used to dig the depression. It looks like a big satellite dish and it's placing gradual slopes. The tape is stretched out and we use that to measure the size of the liner that we'll be placing. So it's a critical importance that you're on site when building a wetland using a synthetic liner because you have to do a lot of measuring. So here you, we put the end of the tape over the piece of rebar. We stretch it out that's equal to the diameter of the liner we're installing. We have to make sure the elevation around the upper rim remains the same. So we use a laser level to check the elevation of the ground at the surface. And the distance on the tape measure is the same as the diameter of the liner we're using. All the elevations around the perimeter must be the same. Any low spots would cause leaks in the wetland area. So elevations are checked every time the excavator moves a few meters. Once the basin is dug to the correct elevation and shape, all rocks are removed by hand. We don't want any sharp rocks under the liner. And this is quite a job. It takes a lot of people to remove these rocks. You don't want any sharp rocks under the liner. And uh, here we're using students at a school to rake the bottom of the depression and to remove the sharp rocks and pieces of glass that may be found. The liners we use are aquatic safe. If you use a liner to build a wetland, it must be fish grade, it must be aquatic safe. It must be safe for drinking water. All liners that are used for roofs, like to keep a roof from leaking, are treated with chemicals. If you use them to build a wetland, they will kill aquatic life in your wetland. So you must ensure that you are using a fish grade liner that is aquatic safe, we transport them to our work site in the back of a pickup truck. And it takes a lot of people, they come factory seamed. The liners and the geotextile comes factory seamed. And here we are placing a layer of geotextile in the bottom of the depression. The next step is to place the aquatic safe liner that is already factory seamed. What are the materials we use for liners? We use 30 mil PVC. 30 mil RPE or 45 mil EPDM. These are all aquatic safe. We cover the liner with geotextile. We anchor the top edge using 12 inch long landscape spikes. This way it won't shift when we're covering it with soil. And here's an example of how the top edge of the three layers are anchored prior to covering. We trim off all excess material that will be above the water level. 
we want this entire liner covered with at least 15 centimeters of soil. We don't want to see any portion of the liner. If you can see the liner, it will deteriorate. If you can see the liner, it will become very hot and can kill amphibians going in and out of your wetland. So here we are, we're ready to cover the liner with soil. We're marking the top cut edge with wire flags so the excavator operator knows where the edge of the liner is. We don't want any heavy equipment to travel over the liner. If heavy equipment travels over the liner, they will cause differential compaction. They will shear the liner. It will not hold water. Absolutely do not put heavy equipment on these liners. Here's the liner that's ready to be covered with soil. The depression looks like a large satellite dish. The rim of the li liner is all the same elevation. An excavator is used to cover the liner with soil, placing 15 to 20 centimeters of soil over the liner. Again, this is important because amphibians and reptiles can burrow into the mud. Plants will grow in the soil. Always cover your liners with soil. Here we've almost finished covering the liner with soil. Then we add large woody debris by hand and using the excavator. This gives the animals places to hide in the new wetland. Notice the wire flag. The wire flag shows you the top edge of the liner. We remove these after construction. And you may ask, why do you need to cover the liner with soil? Well, you never know who's gonna play in your new wetland and you want to make sure that your liner is protected. So when we build wetland areas, we cover the liners with soil, and if a moose gets in there or a cow gets in there, they will not damage that liner. And that liner, we expect it to last over 100 years. What does a wetland look like building a liner? Let's take a look at wetlands built using synthetic liners. Here's an example. Here's another example of a wetland built using a synthetic liner. These wetlands look like any other wetland. We're building wetlands for the endangered California red-legged frog using liners. And here's an example of one of these wetlands we built that's being used by the California red-legged frog. You would never know a liner was buried at this location. Here's another wetland we built using a liner. This was on the El Dorado National Forest in California. We built close to 40 of these wetlands using liners. Talk about ecological lift. This was a blacktop road. We removed the blacktop road and we built a series of wetlands using liners in British Columbia. Here's a wetland we built at a school in the desert region, a Lillooet, British Columbia, using a liner. We used a liner to build this wetland at a school in Kentucky. And you can build wetlands and urban areas using liners. And it's amazing the dragonflies, damselflies that use these and no mosquitoes. No mosquitoes because there are so many mosquito predators living in the water. The mosquitoes may check in, but they won't check out. Here's a wetland we built using a liner at school. And here's another one. Okay, so the techniques that I've gone over today they will allow you to restore or to create a naturally appearing and functioning wetland. You can be successful in restoring and building wetland areas using these techniques. And the wetlands you build will add great beauty to the landscape. You can build wetlands that will provide habitat for a great diversity of flowering plants to provide for pollinators. And the wetlands you build can be targeted to provide habitat for ducks, geese, swans, and many native species of wildlife. But most importantly, the wetlands you build provide great opportunities to watch wildlife. And they'll provide great opportunities for young people to explore their environment and to become interested in helping the environment and hopefully someday protecting a wetland or restoring a wetland area. If you are interested in learning more about the techniques that I use to build wetlands, please order these books that I have written. I wrote these to help you to identify and to restore wetland areas. In the future, I'm willing to give additional webinar topics. 
I have webinars on the functions and values of restored wetlands. I have an unbelievable webinar on the restoration of rivers, streams, and wetlands on large floodplains. I have a webinar on the history of how wetlands were drained, how to control head cuts, which is so important to wetland restoration, how to build vernal ponds or ephemeral wetlands for rare species, and then how we can build wetlands that will clean runoff and recharge groundwater. I really appreciate your attention to this webinar. I ask that you contact me if you have any questions and visit my website. And I really have enjoyed uh, meeting with you today. Thank you.